If you're addicted to love, get ready to binge your heart out on Discovery Plus. Stream exclusive originals or classics like The Bachelor. Plus, you can explore the entire 90-day universe, from the original series to new favorites like The Single Life. With Discovery Plus, you can get all the yeses, all the dresses, and all the hot messes for just $4.99. Discovery Plus is the streaming home of relationships, plus so much more. Start your free trial today. Such a good experience, and it, and it really brings me joy to know that what we did had an impact that's still lasting today. And there's a school that we were able to help build, and that school is still educating children and children are benefiting from that today. Hey folks, welcome to the Adventure Sports Podcast. I'm your host, Mason Gravely. Today we're talking to Greg Robideau about a mountain biking race he did back in the 2000s. Uh, in Pakistan and how life-changing it was and how incredible it was and some of the stories from this experience. It's pretty cool stuff, pretty wild stories. Um, there's there's a little bit of a gross story, just warn you, about uh, some food poisoning. So if you're, you're, your stomach's pretty queasy, you can skip past that part. Ain't, it ain't too bad, though, but I just wanted to warn you. But you can find out more about Greg at, at the Serata Cycling Institute, which is at serratacyclinginstitute.com. It's the longest-running bike fit education and certification outlet in the world, uh, and that's his passion. He's passionate about getting people fitted uh, and certified for fitting uh, on bicycles specifically so they can ride more comfortably. So Greg is awesome, and it was great talking to him. And before we get started, I wanted to let you know about some of our supporters of the show. First, we have a new podcast from Expedia called Out Travel the System. Now in its third season, the show has a central mission to inspire and inform you about traveling. And that can mean anything from building your own bucket list to taking concrete steps to take your next trip when the time is right. The podcast does a great job of finding people who are incredibly passionate about travel, as well as people who love, you know, their hometowns and love the places they're in and inspire you to come visit those places. So if you don't mind, take a moment to pull out your podcast app, whatever you use, find Out Travel the System, like and subscribe it to get their latest episodes because the world's opening up. You need more shows to help inspire you to get out there. This show is all about inspiring adventure, but, you know, travel is one of the logistical things that helps you get to a place like Pakistan to go mountain biking. And another thing you need when you go mountain biking or when you do any sort of adventure is obviously gear. And in the world of travel and adventure, it is easy to say, someday I'm going to do these things. But our friends at Frost River are challenging all of us to start seeking out some days today with sustainably sourced materials and solar-powered manufacturing facilities. Frost River creates every piece of gear by hand right here in the USA. Frost River makes adventure gear like shoulder bags, luggage, packs. You know, you're going to learn how to travel. You need the things to travel in, uh, accessories, all sorts of stuff. And if it's all absolutely durably made, handmade. And for the past two decades, Frost River has set the standard in adventure packs, bags, and gear. Not only is it all made in the U.S., they also do repair packs to thwart away throwaway culture. We're super into that here. And like I said, now using solar energy to create less waste without compromising quality. So stop waiting for your next adventure and start seeking out your someday today at frostriver.com slash adventure sports. Use the promo code ADVENTURE for free shipping on your next order of handcrafted piece of Frost River gear. Check them out. All right, folks. Uh, today, very interesting episode. Something I'm I'm excited to hear about. I hear I hear there's some good stories in here as well. Uh, we're going to be talking about cycling, cycling in Pakistan, cycling in the Himalayas, uh, just cycling in these different places, and, and some cool stories associated with it. Greg Robido, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Yeah, yeah. So I always ask this first: um, Where are you coming from? 
And, and is that home? And if not, where's home? So uh, born and raised in Boston, Massachusetts. Uh, somehow I've avoided the Boston accent for the most part. I was going to say you born and raised. I didn't realize that. Well, what did you grow up doing? You know, being being there, you know, folks heard in the intro, you you do, you know, physical, some per, you know, some training now, so some physical therapy, some you're in the cycling world. But what what did you grow up doing? Did you play sports? Did you go outside a lot as a family? And how did, did you get into it? Yeah, we were we had, I had kind of a unique uh, childhood. You know, my uh, unfortunately my mother was very sick when I was young. Uh, she fought breast cancer for eight years and uh, died in 1986. Uh, I was the age of 11 at that point. And uh, my dad raised myself and my sister. You know, he really instilled upon us a good athletic background. My sister was a, a very accomplished dancer. Uh, myself, I was soccer, basketball, baseball in high school. I played uh, Division One soccer in college. And then did, I didn't. I found cycling kind of late, actually, in in comparison to a lot of people that um, you know cycle competitively. I I was in my early twenties. I had gotten out of school, was doing some some running, some some marathon running. You know, as a physical therapist, I I realized that I was kind of beating myself up a little bit, and decided to find you know some cross training, and I found a bicycle and got on that bicycle and never looked back. Uh, you know, that was that was it for me you know, race competitively through kind of early to mid twenties into my mid to late thirties, you know, and then did buy a house, raise a family, you know, all, all that kind of stuff. And the ironic thing about a lot of this is that, um, you know, working in the cycling industry and, and working, treating cyclists, uh, somehow oftentimes it happens, you, you know, the, the deeper you get into, um, the industry, the, the less time you have to ride, you know, I still, still ride. <laughs> oh my gosh, man. I can't tell you how many times we've heard that here. It's so true. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, oh, people are like, oh, you do adventures all the time. You host the show. I'm like, yeah, you'd think I'm in a closet half the time listening to folks talk about adventures, which I'm happy to do, but yes, continue. Sorry. No, it's, it's, that's all right. And so I, I, I get a lot of enjoyment out of, out of helping cyclists. You know, I still love riding. I still love maybe being competitive with myself at this point. And my kids are getting a little older. Um, you know, I hope to someday get back to doing some masters racing. But you know, at this point, it's it's more just riding for fun, riding with the kids. My my five year old learned to ride uh, at four years old last summer. We were up in Vermont for the summer, riding mountain bikes every day, and she went from uh, a combination of balance bike and training wheels to hitting the jump track on her little pink specialized within like a week, fearless. She's a fierce little lady. How cool was it to see that? It, it, it was phenomenally cool. I mean, my, my, my son is, is getting to be quite the rider himself. And so, you know, he's, he, he chases his mom around, uh, who's, who's a very accomplished mountain biker herself. It, it, in all honesty, my, my wife is, is a better mountain biker than I am. I, I always historically brought good road fitness and that, you know, got me through mountain biking. Uh, but I tend to bash and crash my way through the, uh, through the woods with a big grin on my face, but, right. um, but that's, that's, that's my style. How I, I'm not, I, I don't think I have a lot of mountain bike finesse. Let's put it that way. You know, it, 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 I see people riding and, and it's, they're just flowing through the woods and I can't agree more, man. I feel like I just crash through the woods and, and I, and I fall a lot and I get out the other side and I'm beat up. I feel accomplished, but I wouldn't want to see video of it. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> oh yeah. I make it look hard. I'm, I'm, <laughs> <laughs> yeah I, I don't know I, I, I don't get better over time that's for sure um that's hilarious though well that's really cool that your whole family is kind of into it it does it it sounds like y'all are primarily mountain bikers or is it a mixture of, of road and biker well it's, motor it's a mixture mixture of everything I, I was primarily a roadie and when i met my wife we met doing cyclocross so uh, uh that's kind of in between right you've got she was a primary, primarily a mountain biker, uh, racing on the mountain bike circuit, and uh, I was primarily a roadie, and we met doing cyclocross. She's actually the one that dragged me off to Pakistan. So Yeah, I was going to say, cycling's taken you to some pretty incredible places. Tell us, tell us about this experience. So this, this experience was, was a lot of fun. Um, so this is earlier on. Uh, I had met, 
my wife, Roz, uh, a spectacular woman. And, and she basically said, you know, like, if you're going to hang with me, you gotta, you gotta ride a mountain bike, none of this road bike. And so, so I got, I got my, uh, got a mountain bike and started riding with her and, you know, did, did relatively well in, in the competitive realm, just because I brought good road fitness. I was a good time trialist. That was really my specialty. So, you know, and, and many cross country races aren't super technical. So I was able to just kind of put my head down and drag race through a lot of them. And so she came across this opportunity to go race in Pakistan. And they, they were looking for an American team, a team of five people. Uh, you had to submit a race resume. And so she, you know, we had seen this and she's like, all right, you've got to start doing as many races as you can, because we're going to put our hat in the ring for this. Long story short is that I did a bunch of races. I, I, I had some, some success and um, we sent our resumes off. Uh, we put a team of five together. So it was three, three men, two women, uh, my wife included. And they said, yeah, we'd love to have you. So it was, I can't remember, it was eight or 12 different countries represented. And uh, this was, this was the tour of the Himalayas, essentially a benefit race uh, because of the earthquake in Pakistan in 2005. There was a massive earthquake there, like 8.2 or something like that. And unfortunately in the Kagan Valley, there was a school that was there. And I believe the earthquake hit at like just past nine in the morning and all the kids were in the school and none of them survived. And so uh, some, some prominent business people in the area had put together this race and, and did it as a, a fundraising event for this school to create a school, which is, which is still there and still going strong, by the way, Kagan Valley Memorial Trust. I remember, you know, I had traveled a bit, but just like really you know, the usual suspects, right? You know, Europe and, you know, gone to France and things like that. I, I hadn't really done any, what I would term to be adventurous travel at that point in time. And I remember get, getting the, you know, the acceptance that we were going to go and having all the arrangements made and then breaking it to my father who, who didn't travel a lot and saying, well, I'm, I'm going to be going doing this tour of the Himalayas thing. It's like, wow, that's, that's really cool. That's great. That's great. A couple of days goes by and he goes, where in the Himalayas? I'm like, oh, you know, in the in the Himalayan mountains, like near, you know, near K2, that kind of an area. It's like, oh, okay, okay. And then another couple of days go by and he must have gotten his glow about or something. And he's like, where exactly are you going? I'm like, well, I'm going to Pakistan. And he like lost his mind. What? What are you oh doing? It's crazy. You know, you know, it wasn't the most stable place in the world at that point in time. There was a lot of Taliban, you know, that was more on the Afghan border and we were going to be northeast of uh, so we you know essentially flew into islamabad and went north and east towards you know towards the border of china really you know china nepal so we weren't really near that stuff or at least you know we thought at the time it was quite the adventure we we had made a trip out of it so we went to well, we stayed about a week or two in dubai did some riding there had some pretty crazy adventures in dubai and then uh, off to pakistan you know i remember that that moment coming off the plane and at that point in time, we were really considered, you know, professional athletes and we were treated as such. So they had, you know, some ambassador type folks that met us at the, you know, at walking off the plane and they, you know, sweeped us through customs and all that kind of stuff. One of the crazy things that had happened in all of that travel was that somebody had run over my bicycle with a, a vehicle of some sort oh, and completely tacoed uh, my rear wheel. I was riding a Gary... Fisher Paragon, which is one of the first 29ers and, you know, didn't have great access to mountain bikes, much less a 29 inch wheel for a mountain bike in Pakistan. They did have some uh, like donated BMCs that, and what I ended up doing was I ended up pulling a wheel off of one of those. And so I did the whole race in what's called a 69er. So I had a 29 inch wheel on the front and a 26 inch wheel on the back, which made climbing a little bit difficult because the bike was it was already tilted uphill every time I was on. It. So, um, and the whole race was, was primarily a climbing race. Oh, man. So the, the race itself was in, uh, started in a little town called Naran, which was in the Kagan Valley. The first day was the biggest stage. So it was a th three stage race. Uh, first day was 80 Ks up over the Babasur pass, which, which was up, you know, 14, 15,000 feet elevation. And we started in the valley that day at about 9,000 feet. This is where one of the more entertaining stories 
uh, from this trip happened. Oh man. Well, can I ask you before you get into that, can I ask this, yeah. how frustrating was it that your wheel got smashed? Like that's a huge <laughs> deal before a, I mean, that is, that could really have just devastated you in the sense of I've got to ride this wonky looking bike. What were your spirits about that so, going into it? Were you pretty positive or? You know, I, I was, you know, in all honesty, I was, I was really excited to be there and, and to have the opportunity to race with some, you know, quite frankly, some folks that were way better than myself. But the, the reality was that uh, my options were to ride this BMC, which, you know, although it was a very nice offer, it was, it was a complete piece of junk in comparison to what I was riding. Um, you know, I had this light, you know, hardtail race bike, uh, you know, this thing that they were, you know, going to give to me was something like a 35 pound, you know, really base model mountain bike with, you know, crummy suspension and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, it's like, all right, well, I'll just, I'll just suck it up. You know, like I'm here, it's an adventure. Let's just, you know, it's just one more layer of the adventure. Right. It makes a heck of a story, you know, 15 years later. So yeah, it's worth it. So <laughs> it, yeah, it was, it was definitely worth it. Um, it, I, I don't know if I would have said that in some of the climbing stretches. No, no, that no, I, no. But, <laughs> you need a good decade for it to like, yeah. be worth it. <laughs> yeah. What we, so we had been there for several days prior to the start of the race, just kind of acclimatizing and, and, doing some, you know, some light rides and, and some, uh, some media stuff and, and things like that. The, the typical day was something like, you know, you get up, you have spicy beans and rice and maybe some chicken or goat or something like that. That was kind of what was on the menu and it was delicious. Um, but that was pretty much the meal at every meal time. And then the night before the race, they had set up a banquet for us and they changed up the menu. Uh, they had done this kind of like General Gao's chicken kind of a thing. And yeah, so pretty much everybody that ate it, except for the vegetarians there, got violently ill. Like we all started the race the next day with severe food poisoning. So the race was, you know, we were all, you know, we, they bring us to where the start of the race is going to be. And there's like one little shack that has a toilet in it. And we're all in a giant line waiting to get into the toilet and, and try to just like oh, get everything. Geez. Not pretty at all. Right. And we're, so the, the, the upside is that everybody except for the vegetarians were suffering and they were yucking it up because they were like, you see, you see, this is why we do this. <laughs> right. Um, but anyway, we all get our business done. We get to the, the starting line and then, you know, you know, race day just kicks in. Right. And so we all take off. And it's just a climb out of the gate. So we're just climbing from about 9,000 up to a little over 14,000 feet. It's all, it's not hard. It's, it's like Jeep track and goat track. So it's not super technical riding, but it's, it's hard riding. And it looked pretty rocky. It's, yes, yeah, it's, it's very, very rocky. Um, and a lot of like sheer cliffs so that although some of these tracks were, you know, relatively well established, th there's like a thousand foot drop off on the side. And so, you know, you'd be riding along and then somebody would pull off and, you know, be getting sick. And then, you know, they'd have to try to jump back in the pack and keep going. And so that you'd see somebody pop off every now and then and you, you knew that their belly had just gone south. Right. I made it all the way to the top of the climb. They had brought like they had brought some porters up there and they were giving us like newspaper and stuff to kind of shove into our jerseys for the uh, for the descent. Because it, we had climbed for you know over an hour, hour you know, and then the descent was like epic. There was a lot of, a lot of sheer drops off the edge and you just didn't really look, but you were going like 40 miles an hour on your mountain bike. And you're like, just don't look at the edge. Just, you know. Wow. So, so was the newspaper for padding or was it to keep you warm? Put it under your Jersey just to keep, it's, it's almost like a windbreaker, right? Mm -hmm. So that you're not, because when we left the Valley to start, it was probably like 68 degrees. It was snowing when we got to the top of the climb. Uh, it, it was pretty chilly for the first, you know, 20 minutes of that descent. And I had, I had gotten over the top. I had been suffering a little bit, but, but felt like things were leveling off and, and I was just finding my groove. And at this point in time, I'm, I'm like mid pack, uh, at best, you know, I was kind of happy to be there at that point in time. Like I had been suffering. My belly was not feeling good. I'm like, all right, you know, this is an adventure. This is just, you know, I'm having fun. I had a big smile on my face for the most of it, <laughs> for the most part. I remember my girlfriend, my wife now, uh, she had been so sick that she didn't, she actually 
did not start. But what she did is that she went reverse on the on the course to try to meet some of the American, uh, you know, some of us coming in from the other side. So I had gotten around. We had gotten back down into the valley. I'm 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 racing towards the finish line, and I see her off in the distance. And uh, you know, she meets and she's kind of like riding me in towards the finish. All of a sudden, all of a sudden, my stomach went completely sideways. I'll, I'll set the stage for you. Like I dismounted my bike, like a, like I was coming up at a cyclocross barrier. Uh, this was urgent, like very urgent. And they had given us these jerseys that we were wearing that weren't full zip jerseys. They were like three quarter zip jerseys. And I'm tearing at the jersey, trying to get it off, like throwing my, you know, helmet and my my camel back and all that kind of stuff, and just trying to get my clothes off so I can get what's in me out of me. And I stop. I'm doing my business. My wife is there, and she's like, "Hey," she had kind of taken a look around and said, "Yeah, did you notice that there's there's a village right there, and there's a whole bunch of people uh, walking this way?" And I'm like, "I can't even hear what she's saying because it's just like coming out of me, right?" She's like, "Oh, yep, nope, they're all they're they're coming. They're all walking this way." Uh, can you finish up? I'm like, I'm doing the best I can. <laughs> God, I don't have a lot of control right now. The group of them stop about 50 yards from where I'm sitting or squatting. And this one woman keeps walking and she she stops uncomfortably close to where I am. Now, mind mind you, I am a skinny cyclist with like the the cyclist stripes at this point in time, like super dark tan arms. But now I've ripped my shirt off. I've got my bibs around my ankles and I'm just evacuating all over her front yard, essentially. And she literally stops. And I've got like, I can't, I'm not looking over my shoulder because she's sort of behind me. My wife is kind of like, uh, you need to finish up because I think you're pooping in the front yard. <laughs> and, Holy uh, cow, man. What a... So oh. I, I, I do my business. I get you know, back on the bike as fast as I can and we get out of there. But I swear to God that I, I'm sure they still, that village still talks about the alien that landed in their front yard and pooped in their front yard. Yeah. I bet, I bet it didn't go too well for their opinion on uh travelers. <laughs> yeah. Let's take a quick message break and hear from the folks that help make this show possible. Look, staying healthy isn't easy. Watching your diet, hitting the gym, Avoiding stress. But a good night's rest helps boost your overall health and wellness. And it couldn't be easier. The new Sleep Number 360 Smart Bed is the only bed that effortlessly adjusts and responds to both of you. The result? You wake up ready for anything. Proven quality sleep is life-changing sleep. During our summer sale, save up to $500 on select Sleep Number 360 Smart Beds, plus special financing, only for a limited time. Special financing subject to credit approval. Minimum monthly payments required. See store for details. Calling all families. Discovery Plus has thousands of shows that will bring everyone together. Stream exclusive originals, plus a huge collection of family favorites, all for just $4.99. Discovery Plus is the streaming home for the whole family, plus so much more. Start your free trial. That is plenty of that for now. Let's get back into the episode. Oh my gosh. Man, I... But I made, I, made it, I made it to the end of the race. I wasn't last. And, and that was the, that was how we started. That was our first stage. Um, oh, my. At least everyone else was kind of going through it, too, other than the vegetarians. But that is rough. <laughs> yeah, it was um, <laughs> it was something that we all laughed about quite a bit after after the fact, you know, mostly at my expense. But that was totally fine. <laughs> That's another one of those stories. You need a good decade in between when it happened and in looking back to to really think of it as as, as a fun memory. <laughs> yeah. You also went by some some other pretty interesting places too. You sent me a picture before the interview about being being really close to like a hideout. Yeah, yeah. So that so that was that was actually on our way to Naran. So uh we flew into Islamabad and we had to take this is the Karakuram Highway up to Naran. And this is, this basically is a one way in one way out road. Uh, we were in these big vans and they were transporting us and it was like, you know, like, I don't know, like an hour, nine hour drive because the, the, you know, if you've ever seen some of these, um, images of cars kind of basically dangling off the side of a cliff, uh, while the, and they're trying to pass each other, that's, that's this highway. 
is landslides all the time. And so that it's possible to, you know, be trying to get somewhere, have a landslide and then just be stuck there for a week while they clear out the landslide. But on our way, we stopped to stretch our legs in uh, a suburb of Islamabad called Abbottabad. We just happened to pull over. There was a little roadside stand. They were selling like roasted corn. And we were all like, yeah, let's go grab some of that. And I pretty much had my camera attached to my hip at that point in time. I'm just snapping pictures all over the place. And we had pulled over and I looked over to my right and there was this huge like Russian era jet on a pedestal with a couple of guys sitting underneath it and, you know, using it for shade. And I was like, holy cow, that's cool. Look at that jet. So I clipped a picture of it. And then quite honestly, I'd more or less forgotten about the picture. And some years later, uh, they had released the information about Osama bin Laden being, you know, uh, captured, killed by the uh, Navy SEALs. And they declassified that and that information came out. And they said, well, you know, he was hiding in plain sight in Abbottabad. And I was like, whoa, Abbottabad. And I looked at the timeline and I was like, oh, see, I was there in 2007. So was he. Wow, that's crazy. And so I got onto Google Earth and I was like, I wonder, wonder if that um, jet is still there. So I started looking at Google Earth and seeing if I could find that jet in Abbottabad. And sure enough, the corner that I took that picture on was a, about less than a third of a mile from the Bin Laden compound. Uh, so it was right on the corner. The reason the jet was there is because it was a military academy. And th his compound was was like right down the street from there. You know, so that, you know, a few years later, all my, all my friends were teasing me that I had the, the biggest bounty fail ever because it was like a multi-million dollar price on the guy's head. And I, as an American, I was within a half, you know, a half or a third of a mile of the guy, um, didn't even know it. Should have went in and said, hey, I, I really need to use your bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I'm not sure that would have gone well for me, but right. uh, <laughs> okay, yeah, no kidding. That is a wild. That's a wild story. What 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 did that feel like? Did you? I, I mean, was there any sort of understanding that he might be around, or is that just totally out of the blue for you? Yeah, you know, I mean, so that you know, I had talked about my my father having fears about me traveling there, and so that there was there there were active things going on there, and actually. Um, what what was scarier than that was that we had a banquet the final night in Pakistan, and we had gone to what was kind of the American hotel there, and they had a, a well-known uh, Thai food restaurant. If you ever watched the movie Zero Dark Thirty, the protagonist, the female protagonist in that movie, she's having food in that in that exact restaurant, and the restaurant blows up. Almost a year to the day that we had had our final banquet meal there that was blown up by a truck bomb rode through the gate and uh, exploded it blew off the whole front of that hotel so that was relatively disturbing knowing that i had sat in that spot where that bomb had gone off was just was crazy to me yeah that can that can definitely be feel unsettling um oh my gosh how unfortunate so that that's some some of the crazy stuff from the trip but did, did the rest of the trip feel that intense or was it, you know, you, you were either dealing with sickness or with, uh, you know, military operations. What, what else was going on? <laughs> Once all of our bellies settled down and we just kind of settled into the race, it was like any other race. I mean, it was, it was epic with regards to the terrain and the getting there and, um, you know, all the sights and smells and the people. Um, and I have to say, I mean, the, the, the Pakistani people were amazing. I mean, you know, I, I think you hear this so many, so many times over, but, you know, you go to a place and you see all these folks that have next to nothing and they're willing to share everything that they have with, with you, you know, um, it's really remarkable and it's, it's a humbling experience and one that, that stuck with me to, to this day, um, you know, being able to experience that, being able to see people that were still displaced in 2007 from the 2005 earthquake. And those folks were, were saying, can we give you some food? Can we take care of you? Can we share what we have with you? That's remarkable. That's, that's, it's, it's humbling. And it's, it's a, you know, I feel like it's a real privilege to have experienced that, not just experienced it for the sake of experiencing it, but experiencing it for the sake of understanding life a little bit better. And 
uh, what's really important and those connections uh, to, to the different people that you meet and the experiences that you have with something like that event. You know, I still talk to some of the folks that we raced with back in 2007. They're all really good people and we had such a good experience and it, and it really brings me joy to know that what we did had an impact that's still lasting today. And there's a school that we were able to help build uh, with the money that we raised and that school is still educating children and children are benefiting from that today. That's a, that's a big deal. And that, that, you know, races are fun. We all get into the competition of that stuff, but when something, when an event like that has a deeper meaning, has the potential to not only change your life because of, you know, something that you love doing in a, a race that, you know, you got to be a part of and got to compete in and all that's very exciting. But to know that that had a deeper impact and, and that has a ripple effect even to present day is is pretty remarkable. And, and I think that's one of the things that has always stayed with me. That's amazing. You know, the, the, the combination of adventure with purpose through, uh, you know, fundraising efforts of some sort or some sort of purpose like that. I think it's one of the greatest combinations in, in the world. You know, it's like peanut butter and chocolate. It's just it it is so for our lives and how modern and civilized they are and how you know frankly you know su- survival is not an issue anymore we we can do these purpose driven things i think that combination is amazing and uh to hear someone else say that and reiterate that is is, is awesome what is there anything else you'd like to share about the experience or what you've done after yeah so I remember as far as that race is concerned, I mean, the, the, the first day was probably was pretty epic with regards to um, how massive it was. It was just like, you know, 80 K's on a mountain bike, you know, all over the place. We're all sick. You know, we're all struggling. But the second day, essentially what amounted to like a circuit race around this big glacial lake. And I had just never seen or even raced in a environment like that. And the images from that, you know, I, I, I still see in my head and just, you know, I, I remember kind of being on my bike and, and just pinching myself saying like, wow, like this is, this is a real, this is a real epic adventure. And then the, the, the last day of racing, um, I, I really struggled. I just really suffered. The last day was essentially an uphill time trial. Uh, if you remember, I had a 69er so that my uh, my bike was had a bigger front tire and a smaller rear tire, which basically made, made it feel like I was going uphill already. But there were sections of this climb that were super steep to the point where you had to like almost be laying on your your handlebars in order to keep the bike from tipping backwards. And my bike just wanted to go pop a wheelie every time I got on it because the geometry of the bike wasn't suited to have the rear wheel smaller than the front wheel. The downhills, though. Hey. Oh, the downhills are great. Um, but the, but that day we didn't have any. So I was like, Ooh. it was just a climb and I'm, I'm good at a lot of things on a bicycle. Climbing is, is, uh, has always been my Achilles heel. So, uh, I, I suffered that day, suffered a lot. Again, I don't think I was the last one, but I was, I was close to, I was close to the back of the pack on that day. And I think some of that was that, you know, the altitude had really gotten to me at that point. So Normally, you go and you acclimatize for about two weeks before an event like that. We did it the absolute worst way. I think we were there like three or four days in advance. Yeah, you don't want to. You don't want to do that. That's like from a physiological standpoint, that's like the worst possible time. But that was just our timing. That was just how we had to do it. And so, you know, many of us were suffering from the effects of of altitude at that point. It sounds like a suffer fest in a lot of ways. <laughs> yeah, but again. But again, it was it was one of those suffer suffer fests with with a smile on your face. So it was it was a wonderful opportunity, and you know, events like that are, are one of the things that has really fueled me to help cyclists, to treat cyclists, to do you know do the stuff that I do with regards to you know my uh, my current business, my current passions. So you know, I I uh, I treat cyclists and triathletes exclusively. Um, that's my you know as as a physical therapist there who I'm treating. And then I own a company called the Serata International Cycling Institute, and I uh, I teach biomechanics of cycling and bicycle fit certification. So you know, hopefully, making more people comfortable on bicycles and and performing better and doing all of those things, you know, is is a way to give back to the sport that brought me 
a lot of joy and continues to bring me a lot of joy, you know, not only through events like that, but even just, you know, simply throwing my leg over my bike with my kids and and being able to ride down the road and, and, and see their enjoyment of the sport, you know, and we're not pushing them to, to race or to do anything like that. It's, it's just be on two wheels and have the freedom of, of the wind in your hair and, and, you know, the enjoyment of, of riding a bicycle. So, you know, that, that passion has, you know, permeated what I do for a living and what, what I've, you know, had the opportunity to do in life. So it's, uh, you know, it's, it's a pretty special thing to be able to, to have that balance. Well, where can folks find out more about what you do if they're interested and get in touch? Yeah. So, uh, like I said, my company is the Serata International Cycling Institute. Um, it's the Serata Cycling Institute.com. You can get a hold of me directly through that website. Um, you know, there's also, uh, I also work for Spalding Rehabilitation Hospital and I run the cycling medicine program with my colleague Dana Kotler there, you know, so that I can be found through the uh, Spalding uh, websites. Uh, and that's, that's where I'm doing a lot of my treatment of cyclists. So, well, Greg, I, I appreciate you coming on and telling just a little bit about that wild, wild adventure. I was looking up some pictures of the area you were, you were talking about while you were talking and it's just, I bet it just seemed unreal. Some of the times you were riding, it's beautiful. The Himalayas are just larger than life. So cool. And so to have those experiences just sounds like, you know, to be able to do it now for a living too. I I appreciate you. I I enjoy what you do and bringing these stories to uh, a larger public and, you know, inspiring people to, to, to create their own adventures is, is, is a really powerful thing. And, and, you know, you should be commended for that. So thank you for having me. I I'm, I'm honored to be here. It's it's my pleasure, Greg. It's, it was a cool, some cool stories. That's for sure. And that's what it's all about. So, well, I'll keep you posted when it comes out. We'll, we'll stay in touch about that. But until then, man, take care of yourself and, and let me know if there's anything I can do for you. All right. Thank you so much. All right. Have a good night. You too. Right, take you care. Ready. Bye. First of all, thank you so much for listening. It means the world to us that you choose to listen to this show. If you'd like to help us further, you can leave a review on iTunes, share us with your friends, your family. It goes a long way to grow in the show. You can also support us financially through patreon.com slash adventure sports podcast. Link is in the show notes. And also, if you have an idea of who could be a good guest for the show, we're always looking for people to tell their story uh, about the outdoors or adventure. So if you know someone, please reach out. Email us at info at adventuresportspodcast.com. And until then, get out there and have some fun. If your loved one is at risk of a fall, the Symphony Medical Alert System from CVS Health can help support their safety in their home with 24-7 emergency monitoring, even when you can't be there. Terms and conditions apply. Learn more about Symphony at cvs.com slash symphony or find it at your nearest CVS Health Hub. If you're addicted to love, get ready to binge your heart out on Discovery Plus. Stream exclusive originals or classics like The Bachelor. Plus, you can explore the entire 90-day universe. From the original series to new favorites like The Single Life. With Discovery Plus, you can get all the yeses, all the dresses, and all the hot messes for just $4.99. Discovery Plus is the streaming home of relationships, plus so much more. Start your free trial today.